A lot of companies, they get stuck having to make the same game because this is what the executive leadership want them to do. These game franchises following trends and trying to appeal to a mass audience. Imagine for a moment you just sat down in a movie theater ready to see the latest installment of your favorite movie series. Let's say John Wick. You got your popcorn, favorite beverage, and you're ready for the heart-pounding non-stop action the series is known for. As the title card appears, you hear the crowd clamoring in excitement. An hour in and an unmistakable feeling begins to wash over you. You are bored. This isn't the John Wick you know and love. No, this John Wick has mass appeal. He's funnier, refuses to take a life, and worst of all, it's now PG-13. This time, he's hitting the books. By the end of the movie, you're asking yourself, What the hell is even that? You look around, and to your surprise, half the audience have risen to their feet, giving the movie a standing ovation. What you just witnessed are the effects of catering to the mainstream. This affects most industries in one way or another, but has been becoming increasingly common in the gaming industry. This is because when it comes to AAA games, game design is no longer an art form. It's a business. Appealing to the largest group possible is Business 101, so it's no surprise that publishers are consistently working to appeal to the largest number of players as possible. For a perfect example of this, you needn't look any further than the stealth fantasy Assassin's Creed. When Assassin's Creed first launched back in 2007, it was marketed as a game that lets you take on the role of Altair, an assassin in 1191 AD Jerusalem. Altair belonged to a brotherhood of assassins that lived by the three tenants. Stay your blade from the flesh of the innocent, hide in plain sight, and never compromise the brotherhood. With the three tenants in mind, you are introduced to a simple but satisfying game loop. Get your target, gather information, assassinate your target, escape. As long as you stuck to the three tenants, how you chose to carry out the assassination was completely up to you. The game was a massive success, selling over 8 million copies, making over $240 million worldwide, with a production budget of only $20 million. Even by today's standards, that number would be impressive, but back in 2007, this was absolutely astonishing. Metacritic shows the game currently at an 8.1, with a user score of 7.6. Now let's compare these numbers to the latest installment of the game, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. While the exact numbers have not been released, Ubisoft boasts a staggering 20 million players. This doesn't mean they have sold 20 million copies, as the game has been made available for subscription services like PlayStation Plus. It's still an impressive number that absolutely dwarfs the humble 8 million copies the original game sold. The budget for Valhalla came in around 170 million, but has made over 1 billion in sales making it the most successful Assassin's Creed to date. But looking at the reviews tells a different story. Valhalla has a Metacritic score of 8.2 and a user score of 7.5. On the surface, this looks relatively similar to the numbers of the original, but when you consider the ratio of positive, mixed, and negative reviews, you will notice that Valhalla was much more polarizing than the other Assassin's Creed titles. The first Assassin's Creed at the time of recording has 1,423 user reviews, with 130 of them being negative, just over 9%. Valhalla has a total of 3,202 total user reviews, with 662 of them being negative, about 21%. This is over double that of the original. So how the hell is this game considered the most successful Assassin's Creed game of all time when almost a quarter of the audience reviewed it negatively? Money. Success isn't measured by enjoyment, it's measured by money. It is more profitable to have 21% of 20 million players dislike a game than it is to have 9% of 8 million players dislike it. Bring in as many customers as you can by jumping in on the latest trends with complete disregard for what the game originally was. Valhalla is an Assassin's Creed game in the same way that Metal Gear Survive is a Metal Gear game. It's a name alone. Ask yourself. If I were to remove the title and show it to someone who has only played the first Assassin's Creed, would that person be able to tell you this is an Assassin's Creed game? Personally, I don't believe they would. It is no longer a stealth-based game with some action-adventure mechanics, but has instead become an action-adventure game with some stealth mechanics. There is nothing wrong with that type of game, but it is not what the Assassin's Creed franchise sold itself as. Valhalla could have easily sold itself as a Viking game and still been incredibly successful. So the question is, why didn't they? Money! 
by using the Assassin's Creed name, they can still appeal to those players by using the sunken cost fallacy and fear of missing out. What Ubisoft has done is add as many features to appeal to as many people as possible, many of which completely detract from the original goal of the game. This, in turn, creates a game that offers lots of watered-down mechanics but nothing deep enough to remain entertaining throughout the full playthrough. Every game does not need to appeal to every single player. I'm not a big fan of sports games, but do I wish that the latest Madden added RPG mechanics? God no. Sports games are not meant for me. They are made for sports fans. By adding RPG mechanics, players will be spending less time doing what they love, playing sports, and will now be forced to slog through all the new RPG elements they don't enjoy just to get back to doing what the game is actually about. Please, Kajit stole nothing. Kajit is innocent of this crime. Of course there will be some overlap of RPG and sports fans, but I would argue that just like Assassin's Creed, this would be better as a new IP rather than a new Madden game. This brings me to the first major pitfall of mass appeal in gaming. Publishers are less likely to greenlight new IPs. In doing my research for this video, I made a list of games from three big game publishers. EA, Activision, and Ubisoft. My goal here was to see how many games each publisher released and how many of those were new IPs. I listed each game they released or will release from 2020 through 2023. I didn't include any games that didn't have a confirmed release date. Ubisoft, the creator of Assassin's Creed, has published 44 games, with only 8 of them being new IPs. EA published 37 games, with 6 of them being new IPs. Activision published 10 games, with only one of them being a new IP. So honestly, it's no surprise that YouTube has been flooded with videos about what's killing the gaming industry, or why some people are losing interest in gaming as a whole. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of sequels and remasters that I really enjoy, but I don't feel like it's a stretch to say, in a lot of these cases, many of us would have preferred a new IP. But at the end of the day, the people who control the money needed to create these AAA games don't care about creating a good game. They care about creating a profitable game. With all the biggest publishers looking to check all the same boxes, AAA titles have all started to resemble the same game. An open world, narrative driven game with mechanics from a variety of genres sprinkled throughout. Because of this, sequels and reboots have also begun shifting to check these same boxes, completely changing the type of game it is to match whatever's trending. Some people have said that this is just the natural evolution of games, but I would have to disagree with that statement. As discussed before, Valhalla isn't an assassin game. Natural evolution isn't going from one thing to a completely different thing. Evolution is perfecting and building on what was done before. Valhalla doesn't innovate on anything that contributes to the assassin fantasy, but has instead completely shifted from stealth-based gameplay to a hack-and-slash action adventure that more closely resembles games like The Witcher than the original Assassin's Creed game. I genuinely enjoy open-world narrative-focused games, but I would never have wished that every game released became one. I'd like to see more strategy games, puzzle games, experimental titles like Return of the Obra Dinn, could you imagine the type of game we could get if publishers allowed the developers to focus on creating an interesting, enjoyable game rather than building a game designed to nickel and dime its players through the use of abusive microtransactions like battle passes and day one DLC? Content that would have been included if the design process was more focused on creativity rather than profitability. It's entirely possible to create a game that is both good and profitable. Just look at Elden Ring or God of War. The issue comes in when a game is intentionally made worse to increase profits, like cutting out a chunk of the game to be resold back to you for an additional cost, or taking advantage of people's fear of missing out with a rotating store inventory or battle passes. For a long time, I was the type of person that would have thought the longer a game is, the better. But after spending years studying game design, I have since had a change of heart. I swear this isn't a bash Ubisoft video, but Valhalla is again the perfect example for this. Looking at HowLongToBeat.com, Valhalla has the longest main story of any other Assassin's Creed game, coming in at over 60 hours to beat the main story alone. The issue isn't necessarily the length of the game, but the rate of which new mechanics are being introduced. 
This could be done by introducing new weapons, enemy types, or abilities. No matter how entertaining the game is, after spending so many hours with it, it is bound to get old if nothing changes. This is why games like Fortnite are consistently updated to keep the game new and exciting. But in Valhalla, you are introduced to most mechanics that are present in the game within the first 15 to 20 hours. This means that now Valhalla has to carry you through an additional 40 hours of content with the story alone. For me, I thought the story wasn't bad, but it's not a story that takes 60 hours to tell. The story honestly shouldn't take more than 30 to 45 hours max. The remaining 30 hours is basically just bloat added to stretch out the story as long as possible with no concern of how it will impact the pacing of the game. So what exactly is bloat? This can vary from person to person, but for me, bloat is anything added to the game that doesn't contribute or work to enhance the primary gameplay loop, meaning bloat in one game isn't necessarily bloat in another game. For example, in a survival game, hunting and fishing would be great mechanics that would contribute directly to the primary gameplay loop. Adding a card game, however, I would consider bloat. Having some bloat to a game isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it can be nice to have something that allows you to take a break from the primary loot. See Gwent from The Witcher as a perfect example. But with Valhalla, it seems like Ubisoft just went through a list of features that people enjoy in games and just checked boxes with no regard of how these mechanics contribute to the primary gameplay loop. This makes the game play more like a collection of random mechanics rather than one cohesive game. This type of development has become more common as publishers began pushing developers to check as many of these boxes as possible to appeal to as many players as possible. You have likely seen publishers and developers pushing to include multiplayer in a game that was never intended to support it. Mass Effect, Splinter Cell, Dead Space have all fallen victim to this trend. Again, this isn't a commentary on whether those games multiplayer are any fun or not, but for someone who doesn't play or enjoy multiplayer games, there is a fear that the quality of the single player experience can be diminished since time and funds are now being allocated to building a multiplayer experience that could have gone to the single player experience. This could be made even worse when the developer decides to make the multiplayer part mandatory. This happened in Mass Effect 3. This has since been fixed, but for those who played the game on release like myself and wanted to get the best ending, you had no choice. This point was never really a big issue for me because I personally enjoy multiplayer games, but does every game need to have multiplayer? I honestly don't think so. Just like I don't think every game needs to have a single player experience. Multiplayer is one of the easiest ways to extend the life of a game, but this is no longer the main reason we see so many multiplayer modes being shoehorned into single player experiences. Multiplayer games make significantly more money than single player games do. Elden Ring won Game of the Year this year and has sold over 17.5 million copies. At $60 per copy, this would mean that Elden Ring has made over a billion dollars since its release. This would be a low estimate since I'm not taking into consideration the deluxe edition that sold for $80. For comparison, let's increase that amount by 50%, just to be safe, putting the revenue for this game at $1.5 billion. Let's compare this to one of the biggest multiplayer games out right now, Fortnite. Fortnite has made roughly 5 billion in the year of 2022, and this is a free to play game. And unlike Elden Ring, Fortnite is likely to see an increase in revenue for 2023. Since the popularization of games as a service, game design has shifted from creating good games to creating the most effective vehicle for monetization, and multiplayer just so happens to be that vehicle for many new titles. The Goku skin in Fortnite originally cost 2,000 V-Bucks, which equates to about 15 US dollars. You can actually buy Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2 for less than it would cost just to look like Goku in Fortnite. So what can we actually do about it? At the end of the day, these tactics work because we allow them to. We sign up for the battle passes, pay an additional $10 to $30 just to get the digital deluxe edition. Until we are willing to put our money where our mouth is, this is not only going to continue, but it's going to get worse. There are still many developers out there that are passionate about creating the best game possible. Indie studios have brought us some amazing titles like Hades, Stray, Hollow Knight, Katana Zero. These games still have the passion that has long since been missing in AAA titles. I have no doubt that the people working on these AAA titles want nothing more than to make the best game possible, but they're shackled by corporate greed. The next time you're asked if you want to buy more V-Bucks, Helix credits, or Eternal Orbs, Stop it! 
get some help. Maybe give it a second thought as to if it's actually worth paying a quarter of a fully priced game just to look like Goku. Or are you just falling victim to one of the many predatory monetization strategies and your own fear of missing out? If you enjoyed this video, hit that like and subscribe button. It truly means the world to me and it helps me create more content just like this. I guess at the end of the day, all I'm trying to say here is game responsibly.